Hello, hello everybody and how are you? I hope you are doing well. It's rather warm here at the moment for New Zealand, for this part of New Zealand. If you are from, say, somewhere like Brisbane or the Cape York Peninsula in Australia or Northern Territory, places like Darwin, you will think it's not warm. You will think it's pleasantly balmy. Not even that, maybe a little bit cool. But for us here in New Zealand, I would say it's pretty warm. Uh, the idea being that, if possible, you have all the windows and doors open. It's that warm. In this part of New Zealand, my daughter lives down in Wellington, and I can't say what the weather will be like for her, because that's one of the things about New Zealand weather. It is so varied from one end of the country to the other. And because we are a small country, sorry, because we're a small country, Oh, geographically, I suppose it's not that small. It's kind of like the UK, um, but for for its for its area, land area, it's actually quite stretched out. It's like take the British Isles and stretch them gently so that they go reasonably evenly from one end to the other. For width, there'll be a few bits that get skinnier than others, and you'll actually find that we cover quite a lot of length of of top to bottom, north to south. It's quite a long way actually for the land area we've got but it means that we have a thousand miles whatever that is in kilometers 1500 i don't know um 1200 no it's more than 1200 of ocean on the west side of us and a thousand miles of ocean on the east more than a thousand miles of ocean on the east side of us the closest land mass to us uh, country-wise is australia and australia is a thousand sea miles away nautical miles away that's a long way. That's a lot of swimming or flying. Tired arms. Anyway, so um, they have a lot more stable climate than what we do because theirs is largely regulated by the fact that they have a large land mass. Here's your science lesson for today. Um, yes, I know you came here to listen to stories, but hey, you're going to learn from those, so you might as well learn this little bit extra as well. Um, so when you have a large land mass, which is... Um, has like, like with Australia, the centre of well, a lot of Australia is um, dry land. The 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 habitable er, um, areas of Australia tend to run around the borders, around the edge, and then there's a bit in the middle, like Alice Springs and places like that. The rest of it is very hard to live in because of the lack of water easily accessible. Uh, they don't have a lot of rain when it's not the rainy season, things like that. And so because of that, this mass of dry land in the middle tends to affect what weather does around the whole of that continent, even though it's also an island, the island and continent of Australia. Uh, so their weather tends to not be quite as rapidly changeable as ours from what I understand. Um, we used to say to visitors to New Zealand, uh, if you don't like the weather, just wait 10 minutes. It's not usually quite that changeable, but it can be. So like I've changed which windows downstairs are open because of which way the wind's blowing three times today because the wind was coming from one side and then it was coming from another and then it was back to the first and so on. We'll see how we get on today with hopefully... I've got a nice little bit of a breeze around my ankles at the moment, so hopefully that will help me to stop being quite so overheated. Um, it's always good if you're not too hot, so that you can actually enjoy what it is you're doing. Um, we shall start reading in a minute or two. Um, part of me chattering like this is because it gives people a chance to arrive and get over watching the ads that run at the beginning of the, of the when you arrive because I'm now affiliate, so that means you get ads. Technically, that means I can make money, but so far I've made like three cents off ads running, so just ignore that. <laughs> yeah, so if you get here earlier than when I'm going to start reading, that it gets the ads out of the way for you. Um, and for those who are arriving at three o'clock expecting me to start reading, I'm giving them an opportunity to get the ads out of the way before I, so they don't miss any story. That's part of how it goes. Um, what are we looking for? I need to set up my pictures. Um, oh, there's another siren going down the road. Oh dear. 
There's been a lot of those recently in the last few days. I'm not quite sure what's going on. I'm sure part of it I think is the heat. There's an, uh, an old folks home up the road from us. Um, there may be some of the people there are not coping well with the heat. As far as I know they haven't got COVID at the rest home so that's good. Um, we're still being careful here in New Zealand. There is still some, there is COVID around. We're still trying to stop it at the borders with the, the next version of it that spreads really easily, but apparently isn't quite as, as dangerous. But still, we don't want everyone to get it. Um, so we tend to be a little bit cautious. I wear a mask when I go grocery shopping because we're meant to be wearing a mask. We scan in, we register where we are, all that sort of stuff. Um, and thank you for following. That's wonderful. Um, so there's just lots of that sort of stuff goes on, which is a big part of why I'm reading these stories. So you have an opportunity to get out of the headspace that you currently live in. Um, the headspace not being specifically your headspace, but just what it's like where you are living. It can be really uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, it's good to have something else to think about. It's good to have something else to focus on, to ponder on. You come across different aspects of a story which you want to find out a little bit more about so you can look it up. It gives you something positive, relatively speaking, that you can focus on for a time. And also it's nice to not have bickering people on the radio or the TV or something like that as being the only company that you've got for outside voices to listen to. So I think that's probably enough yattering from me. Oh, and if you're new here, hi, I'm Jeff. I read old-fashioned children's stories, in case you haven't already figured that one out. I live in New Zealand. One of the nicknames is NZ, because of the way we say the letters at the beginning of our, our country name. Um, and I've been reading old-fashioned children's stories for nearly two years. So there you go. Anyway, we shall carry on and actually read this blimmin' story. We are currently reading... Peter and Wendy, which most of us know as Peter Pan, uh, by J.M. Barry, And the version I'm reading is not abridged. So it's got all sorts of delightful things in it, which in the more modern versions have been sanitised out of it. Whitewashed away, some of them. Some of it's not so good because it's... It shows some racist attitudes. Some of it's just very old-fashioned ways of expressing things. So we shall put up with it and carry on and maybe get some good stuff out of it too. Um, yeah, so it's definitely not the Disney version of the stories. And hopefully we'll be able to see some of the pictures from it as we go through the book. We are. I'm reading Peter and Wendy by J.M. Barry, Chapter 7, Home Under the Ground. Ooh. One of the first things Peter did the next day was to measure Wendy, John and Michael, the hollow trees, because the last chapter we had, they were chasing around the island after each other, various ones were, and the pirates found where the lost boys were living under the ground, which they hadn't been able to find before. And Captain Hook thought it was ridiculous that they had a hole for every person that lived in, in their house under the ground. And so we're going to address that now. One of the first things Peter did next day was to measure Wendy and John and Michael for hollow trees. Hook, you remember, had sneered at the boys for thinking they needed a tree apiece. Yeah, because as an adult, it, it seems a bit of an odd thing too, to me. Um, but this was ignorance, for unless your tree fitted you, it was difficult to go up and down. And no two of the boys were quite the same size. Once you fitted, you drew in your breath at the top and down you went at exactly the right speed. While to ascend, you drew in and let out alternately and so wiggled up or wriggled up. Of course, when you have mastered the action, you are able to do these things without thinking of them and then nothing can be more graceful. So it's, and so I'm imagining it being a little bit like a worm wriggling through their tunnels in the ground where they expand and contract a little to move their way along. I'm just changing the setup here so I can see it at a better distance and don't need to keep looking down quite so far. Anyway, we shall carry on. Uh, 
and that was that page. And then nothing can be more graceful. Sorry, I didn't say it, but I've got ADHD. It's not diagnosed, but it's pretty obvious to anyone who knows me. So I can get a little bit easily distracted. And that includes getting partway through a sentence. My eyes are looking at the page and I momentarily look up at you and then I look back at the page and my mind goes blank as to where it was I was looking. And so it's, it takes a moment or two to find it again. But hey, we're getting there. <sighs> but you simply must fit. And Peter measures you for your tree as carefully as for a suit of clothes. The only difference being that the clothes are made to fit you while you have to be made to fit the tree. Usually it is done quite easily as by your wearing too many garments or too few. But if you are bumpy in awkward places or the only available tree is an odd shape, Peter does some things to you and after that you fit. Hmm, I wonder what sort of things he does. Hmm, once you fit... Great care must be taken to go on fitting, and this, as Wendy was to discover to her delight, keeps a whole family in perfect condition, so you don't put on too much weight. Wendy and Michael fitted their trees at the first try, but John had to be altered a little. After a few days' practice, they could go up and down as gaily as buckets in a well, and how ardently they grew to love their home under the ground, especially Wendy. It consisted of one large room, as all houses should do, with a floor in which you could dig if, uh, dig if you wanted to go fishing. And in this floor grew stout mushrooms of a charming colour which we used as stools. A never tree tried hard to grow in the centre of the room, but every morning they sawed the trunk through level with the floor. By tea time... By tea... Come on, turn around, thank you. Sorry, just trying to get this to lean the right way, which means I have to turn it the other way up. And sorry for banging the microphone. By tea time it was always about two feet high and then they put a door on top of it and the whole thus becoming a table. That makes sense. As soon as they cleared away they sawed off the trunk again and thus there was more room to play because it's back down to floor level. There was an enormous fireplace which was in, which was in almost any part of the room where you cared to light it. And across this, Wendy stretched strings made from fibre from which she suspended her washing. The bed was tilted against the wall by day and let down at 6.30 when it filled nearly half the room and all the boys except Michael slept in it, lying like sardines in a tin. There was a strict rule against turning round until one gave the signal, when all turned at once, after the signal was given. Michael should have used it also, but Wendy would have a baby, and he was the littlest, and you should know what women are, and the shortest, and the long of it, uh, and the shorter the long of it is that he was hung up in a basket as a group baby. <laughs> um, do you remember the kids' nursery rhyme? Um, there were ten in the bed, and the little one said... There were ten in the bed, and the little one said, roll over, roll over. So they all rolled over, and one fell out. There were nine in the bed, and the little one said, and so it goes until you get to zero. It's another one of those journey songs, journey as in trip, back of the car songs that you sing like um, Ten Green Bottles and things like that. But it reminds me of this. It always, that This always reminds me of the song, and the song always reminds me of this scene where they're talking about the bed and they have to all roll over together. But obviously they do it carefully so nobody falls off and lands on the floor and stays on the floor. They've got it worked out. Anyway, so it was rough and simple and not unlike what baby bears would have made of an underground house in the same circumstances. But there was one, rec but there was one recess in the wall, no larger than a birdcage, which was the private apartment of Tinkerbell. It could be shut off from the rest of the home by a tiny curtain which Tink, who was, a most, who was most fastidious, always kept drawn when dressing or undressing. No woman, however large, could have had a more exquisite boudoir and bedchamber combined. The couch, as she always called it, was a genuine Queen Mab with club legs and she varied the bedspreads according to what fruit blossom was in season. So it sounds like she's using fruit flowers. <laughs> And thank you for following. Her mirror 
was a puss in boots, of which there are now only three unchipped, known to the fairy dealers. The washstand was pie crust and reversible. The chest of drawers, an authentic, charming the sixth, and the carpet and rugs of the best, the early, period of Marjorie and Robin. There was a chandelier from Tiddlywinks, for the look of the thing, but of course she lit the residence herself, because she's a fairy. That was how the children knew about her in the first place, was because of the light from her. So, we'll carry on. I'm trying to find the right place on the page, which is what I was just telling you about before, wasn't it? Um, chandelier from Tiddlywinks for the look of the thing, but of course she lit the residence herself. Tink was very contemptuous of the rest of the house, as indeed was perhaps inevitable, and her chamber, though beautiful, looked rather conceited, having the appearance of a nose permanently turned up. Mm, mine's better than yours. She does seem to have that sort of a feel about her. I suppose it was all especially entrancing to Wendy because those rampageous boys, maybe they're thinking rambunctious, rampageous boys of hers gave her so much to do. Really, there were whole weeks when, except perhaps with a stocking in the evening, she was never above, above ground. The cooking, I can tell you, kept her nose to the pot. Their chief food was roasted breadfruit, yams, coconuts, baked pig, Mammy apples, tapper rolls, and bananas washed down with calabashes of popo. But you never exactly knew whether there would be a real meal or just a make believe one. It all depended entirely upon Peter's whim. He could eat, really eat, if it was part of a game, but he could not stodge just to feel stodgy, which is what most children like better than anything else. The next best thing being to talk about it. Make-believe was so real to him that during a meal of it, you could see him getting rounder and rounder. Of course, it was trying, but you simply had to follow his lead. And if you could prove to him that you were getting loose for your tree, he let you stodge. Wendy's favourite time for sewing and darning was after they had all gone to bed. Then, as she expressed it, she had a breathing time for herself. And she occupied it in making new things and putting double pieces on the knees, for they were almost frightfully hard on their knees, so that's like having a elbow patches on a certain type of, of cardigan so that you don't wear through. When she sat down to a basket full of their stockings, every heel had a hole in it. She would fling up her arms and exclaim, Oh dear, I'm sure I sometimes think spinsters are to be envied. Spencer's not having husbands or children, obviously. That's how it looked. Her face beamed when she exclaimed this. You remember about her pet wolf? Well, it very soon discovered that she had come to the island and it found her out. And they just ran into each other's arms. After that, it followed her about everywhere. I don't remember what the pet, pet wolf was about, do you? Sorry. As time wore on, did she, as time wore on, did she think much about the beloved parents she had left behind? This is a difficult question because it is quite impossible to say how time does wear on in the Neverland, where it is calculated by moons and suns, and there are ever so many more of them than on the mainland. But I am afraid that Wendy did not really worry about her father and mother. She was absolutely confident that they would always keep the window open for her to fly back by. And this gave her complete ease of mind. What did disturb her at times was that John remembered his parents vaguely only, as people he had once known, while Michael was quite willing to believe that she was really his mother. These things scared her a little, and no, nobly anxious to do her duty, she tried to fix the old life in their minds by setting them examination papers on it as like as possible to the ones she used to do at school. The other boys thought this awfully interesting and insisted on joining. And they made slates for themselves and sat around the table writing and thinking hard about the questions she had written on another slate and passed round. They were the most ordinary questions. What was the colour of mother's eyes? Which was taller, father or mother? Was mother blonde or brunette? Answer all three questions if possible. A. Write an essay of not less than 40 words on how I spent my last holidays or the characters of father and mother compared. Only one of these to be attempted. Or 
One, describe mother's laugh. Two, describe father's laugh. Three, descri describe mother's party dress. Four, describe the kennel and its inmate. So those are sample quizzes, the exams that she gave them. They were just everyday questions like these, and when you could not answer them, you were told to make a cross. And it was a really dread, and it was really dreadful what a number of crosses even John made. Of course, the only boy that's a X, like um, when you get it wrong. Of course, the only boy who replied to every question was sprightly, and no one could have been more hopeful of coming out first. But his answers were perfectly ridiculous, and he really came out last. A melancholy thing. Peter did not compete. For one thing, he despised all mothers, because his mother had lost him. He despised all mothers except Wendy, and for another, he was the only boy on the island who could neither write nor spell. Not the smallest word. He was above that sort of thing. By the way, the questions were all written in the past tense. What was the colour of mother's eyes and so on? Wendy, you see, had been forgetting too. Adventures, of course, as we shall see, were of daily occurrence. But about this time, Peter invented, with Wendy's help, a new game that fascinated him enormously until he suddenly had no more interest in it. Which, as you have been told, was what always happened with his games. It consisted in pretending not to have adventures in doing the sort of thing John and Michael had been doing all their lives. Sitting on stools, flinging balls in the air, pushing each other, going out for walks and coming back without having killed so much as a grizzly, to see Peter doing nothing on a stool was a great sight. He could not help looking solemn at such times. To sit still seemed to him such a comic thing to do. He boasted that he had gone for a walk for the good of his health. For several sons, they were, these were the most novel of all adventures to him, and John and Michael had to pretend to be delighted also, otherwise he would have treated them severely. They wouldn't have been delighted because that was normal life for them before they came to the island, before they came to Neverland. He often went out alone, and when he came back, you were never absolutely certain whether he had had an adventure or not. He might have forgotten it so completely that he said nothing about it, and then when you went out, you found the body... And on the other hand, he might say a great deal about it, and yet you could not find the body. In other words, it was an, an adventure in his head. Sometimes he came home with his head bandaged. And when Wendy cooed over him and bathed it in lukewarm water while he told a dazzling tale, and then she did, not and when she did. But she was never quite sure, you know. There were, however, many adventures which she knew to be true because she was in them herself, and there were still more that were at least partly true, for the other boys were in them and said they were wholly true. To describe them all would require a book as large as an English-Latin, Latin-English dictionary. I'm guessing that they uh, had one of those, um, and it would be rather big. And the most we can do is give one as a specimen of an average hour of the, uh, on the island, an example of one of the stories. The adventures. The difficulty is which one to choose. Should we take the brush with the redskins at Slightly Gulch? It was a sanguinary affair, and especially interesting as showing one of Peter's peculiarities, which was that in the middle of a fight he would suddenly change sides. At the gulch, when victory was still in the balance, sometimes leaning this way and sometimes that, he called out, I'm redskin today. What are you, Tootles? And Tootle answered, Redskin, what are you, Nibs? And Nibs said, Redskin, what are you, Twin? And so on, and they were all Redskin. And of course, this would have ended the fight had not the real Redskins, fascinated by Peter's methods, agreed to be lost boys for that once. And so at it they all went again, more fiercely than ever. The extraordinary upshot of this adventure was, but we have not decided yet that this is the adventure we are to narrate. Perhaps a better one would be the night attack by the redskins on the house under the ground when several of them stuck in the hollow trees and had to be pulled out like corks. Or we might tell how Peter saved Tiger Lily's life in the mermaid, Mermaid's Lagoon and so made her his, his ally. Or we could tell of the cake the pirates cooked so that the boys might eat it and perish and how they placed it in one cunning spot after another. But always Wendy snatched it from the hands of her children so that in time it lost its succ succulence and became as hard as a stone and was used 
as a missile and Hook fell over it in the dark. It would have hurt his toe if he stubbed his toe on it. Or suppose we tell of the birds that were Peter's friends, particularly of the never bird that built in a tree overhanging lagoon, the lagoon and how the nest fell into the water and still the bird sat on her eggs and Peter gave orders that she was not to be disturbed. That is a pretty story. And the end shows how grateful a bird can be. But if we tell it, we must also tell the whole adventure of the lagoon, which would of course be telling two adventures rather than just one. A shorter adventure, and quite as exciting, was Tinkerbell's attempt, with the help of some street fairies, to have the sleeping Wendy conveyed on a great floating leaf to the mainland. Fortunately, the leaf gave way and Wendy woke, thinking it was bath time, and swam back. Or again, we might choose Peter's defiance of the lions, when he drew a circle round him on the ground with an arrow, and defied them to cross it. And though he waited for hours, with the other boys and Wendy looking on breathlessly from the trees, not one of them dared to accept his challenge. Which of these adventures shall we choose? The best way will be to toss for it. I have tossed, and the lagoon has won. This almost makes one wish that the gulch, or the cake, or Tink's leaf had won. Of course, I could do it again and make it best out of three. However, perhaps fairest to stick to the lagoon. And that's the end of chapter seven. So it's time for me to have a drink. And I didn't do that. I didn't tell you that. And you didn't tell me that I'd forgotten. Naughty, naughty. Okay, so one of the, one of the, about, I've got a few rules, kind of, be nice to each other. Um, there are people who watch this with their children. So we keep bad language and implications out of the chat. Um, I don't tend to swear, so it's appropriate for you to hold your tongue on swearing as well. It doesn't gain you anything here. All it does will, is likely to get you banned or blocked. So don't bother trying. Um, rules other than that we have are bring something to drink. I bring water because it's really good for keeping you hydrated and hydration is good yes for my voice for being able to read stories to you but it also making sure you're hydrated means that your body works better and so does your brain if you haven't had enough to drink you will not be able to think very well and you're possibly going to also have a, he a headache that would be horrible you don't want that um, so have something brings when you come next time if you haven't already done it and you can do this now if you rush off bring a drink and something to snack on and grab yourself somewhere comfortable to sit unless you're having to work and then you just have to put up with whatever seat you've got for working I'm going to rattle here and get out my crackers scrummy Pam's finest sesame water wafer crackers not water crackers these they're quite yummy and nicely crisp which is probably very noisy for you sorry mm-hmm I saw the sound meter go up when I crunched it be with you again in a minute this is your chance to go off and get your water and snacks and find that comfortable bean bag or towel or if it's really cold where you are a blanket to wrap yourself up in a sun hat if you're outside and listening all that sort of stuff So, have you got them yet? Are you ready? I'm just going to have some more water. Mm. 
nearly ready to start. That pa- that chapter had no pictures whatsoever. And did you know? Answer me this. Did you know? Ah, oh, you probably don't, but I'm just gonna go ahead and ask anyway. Um, back in the old old days, when I was a kid. If you had a playhouse in the backyard for children to play in, like pretend house, um, it was often called a Wendy house. And the reason it's called a Wendy house is because of the story. I'm pointing at my book in front of me, which is actually my iPad mini. A Wendy house because the boys made a house for Wendy, which is Wendy's house, the Wendy house. Actually, I think at some stage further on in the book, they actually call it the Wendy house. Um, and I forgot to say that last time, was that the house that they were building in our previous um, day's reading was why we now have what is called a Wendy house. Anyone who's an older generation who refers to a children's playhouse as a Wendy house. Well, a lot of them do. Anyway, so there you go. That's just for something different, isn't it? Um, We shall carry on with the next chapter, I think. I think I'm ready. Oh, it's getting warm again. Sorry, try and get so I'm not too hot. Right, chapter eight, The Mermaid's Lagoon. If you shut your eyes and are a lucky one, you may see at times a shapeless pool of lovely pale colours suspended in the darkness. Then if you squeeze your eyes tighter, the pool begins to take take shape and the colours become so vivid that with another squeeze, they must go on fire. That's squeezing your eyelids shut tight. But just before they go on fire, you see the lagoon. This is the nearest you ever get to it on the mainland. Just one heavenly moment. If there could be two moments, you might see the surf and hear the mermaids singing. Now surf is on a beach, an ocean beach. So I'm guessing that the lagoon is just behind a surf beach. And why I'm slightly distracted now is I'm looking for the next picture. No, and this is looking in my other book, which is the version that, not this particular physical copy, I don't think, but this is the version I first grew up with. Later on, I read the, this one's abridged, so it's uh, it's shortened, it's made a little bit easier to follow for small children. The illustrations in it are more specifically done for small children. They are done by a lady called Lucy Mabel Atwell. And if you look her up, you'll find that she did a lot of children's illustrations. And I think she did some Mother Goose nursery rhymes that she illustrated and it was published as a book. So this is from last time. Peter sitting asleep at the door guarding Wendy, who is asleep in her new Wendy house. There's Peter Pan. That's Peter Pan. That is John's top hat, which has had the top punched out of it to use as a chimney for Wendy's house and these are the fairies who are going home from their carousing, their partying um, and all they did was tweak his nose whereas if it was anybody else they would have actually been a little bit more sharp with them. Um, so that's the style of, of illustration in this particular copy but the one that I'm reading to you from has much more detailed illustrations and my intention is to actually show you those when I get to them in that part of the story which isn't necessarily where they are actually in in the story itself but in the book Um, so yeah the last chapter we had didn't have any illustrations I don't know if this one does I hope it does we shall carry on shan't we that's enough about that right the mermaid's lagoon the If there could be but two minute moments, you might see the surf and hear the mermaids singing, as well as seeing the uh, lagoon itself. The children often spent long summer days on this lagoon, swimming or floating most of the time, playing the mermaid games in the water, and so forth. You must not think from this that the mermaids were on friendly terms with them. The mermaid... um, On the contrary, it was among Wendy's lasting regrets that all the time she was on the island, she never had a civil word from one of them, because 
she had probably daydreamed about mermaids and the impression we're given is that they're sweet and lovely same with fairies we'll see what happens in the story she never had a civil word from one of them when she stole softly to the edge of the lagoon she might see them by the score that's a score a dozen is 12 a score i think is 20 or 24 you can look that up and type it into into the sorry type it into the chat box over there um, and then if you find out the information and type it in there i will read it out loud so that the people who watch this on youtube later on Sorry, my hair's doing weird things. Watch it on YouTube later on, because they won't have that chat box. They will know what it is you wrote in there for them. Um, a score. I think it's 20, but I'm not sure. I'll carry on. She might see them by the score, especially on Maruna's Rock, where they loved to bask, combing out their hair in a lazy way that quite irritated her. Or she might even swim, on tiptoe as it were, to within a yard of them, but then they saw her and dived probably splashing her with their tails, not by accident, but intentionally. Oh, we have a picture, yay! We'll see if this is the right one. Yes, it is! Wonderful! The sequence of, of illustration order that I have in the book, for some reason, is slightly different to the sequen sequence that I've actually got here. In, on my computer. So here's someone diving in, there's birds flying, there's, that's a mermaid, that one that's there with her back arched and her hair hanging down and her arms raised up and that looks like a rainbow coming down and you've got the, there's the mermaids all around here swimming and it's, yeah, it's all mermaids. I'm looking at it in the book because it's a little easier for me to see. Hopefully it's nice and big on your monitor so you can see it. So they're all chatting with each other and playing. And I would guess that this is Peter flying down. But I'm not sure. We shall carry on. And it says, Summer Days in the Lagoon. And we had finished with... The sentence before was that they saw her and dived, probably splashing her with their tails, not by accident, but intentionally. So for some reason, the mermaids don't want to be friendly with, with um, Wendy. That's what her name is. See, I told you I forget things. Um, it's just the way my brain works. They treated all the boys in the same way, except, of course, Peter, who chatted with them on Maruna's Rock by the hour and sat on their tails when they got cheeky. He gave Wendy one of their combs. The most haunting time at which to see them is at the turn of the moon, when they utter strange wailing cries. But the lagoon is dangerous for mortals then. And until the evening of which we have now to tell, Wendy had never seen the lagoon by moonlight. Less from fear, for of course Peter would have accompanied her, than because she had strict rules about everyone being in bed by seven. Because she's being the mother, she's playing mother, and so, of course, she's going to have the same sort of rules as what she has at home, the rules that she's been given at home. She was often at the lagoon, however, on sunny days after rain when the mermaids come up in extraordinary numbers to play with their bubbles, the bubbles of many colours made in rainbow water. They treat as balls, hitting them gaily from one to another with their tails and trying to keep them in the rainbow till they burst. The goals are at each end of the rainbow and the keepers are only allowed to use their hands. Sometimes hundreds of mermaids will be playing in the lagoon at a time and it is quite a pretty sight. But the moment the children tried to join in, they had to play by themselves for the mermaids immediately disappeared. Nevertheless, we have proof that they, were, they secretly watched the interlopers and were not above taking an idea from them for John introduced a new way of hitting the bubble. With the head instead of the hand and the mermaid goalkeepers adopted it so that now it becomes soccer in some ways this is the one mark john has left on the neverland it must also have been rather pretty to see the children resting on a rock for half an hour after their midday meal wendy insisted on their doing this and it had to be re a real rest even though the meal was make-believe so they lay with air in the sun and their bodies glistened in it while she sat beside them and looked important. She's the mother, remember? It was one such day and they were all on Maruna's rock. The rock was not much larger than their great bed, of course. 
but of course they all knew how not to take up much room, and they were dozing or at least lying with their eyes shut and pinching occasionally when they thought Wendy was not looking. She was very busy stitching. While she stitched, a change came in the lagoon. Little shivers ran over it and the sun went away, and shadows stole across the water, turning it cold. Wendy could no longer see to thread her needle, and when she looked up, the lagoon that had always hitherto been such a laughing place seemed formidable and unfriendly. It was not, she knew, that night had come, but something as dark as night had come. No worse, no, worse than that, sorry. It had not come, but it had sent that shiver through the sea to say that it was coming. Yes, the anticipation of something is often worse. We shall carry on. Uh, it had sent a shiver through the sea to say that it was coming. What was it? There crowded upon her all this, there crowded upon her all the stories she had been told of Maruna's Rock, so called because evil captains put sailors on it and leave them there to drown. They drown when the tide rises, for then it is submerged. So obviously Maruna's Rock is actually um, the lagoon, sorry, Maruna's Rock, rock in the lagoon. The lagoon is in a t is, is a tidal lagoon. Some lagoons aren't, but that would be what this is about. Um, and they drown when the tide rises, for then it is submerged. Of course, she should have roused the children at once, not merely because of the unknown that was stalking towards them, but because it was no longer good for them to sleep on a rock grown chilly. But she was a young mother, and she did not know this. She thought you simply must stick to your rule about half an hour after the midday meal, the rule being that you mustn't go for a swim for half an hour after you've eaten. Uh, when I was growing up, it depended on who you were with. Sometimes it was a quarter of an hour, sometimes it was half an hour, sometimes it was an hour. <coughs> I also think it depended on how impatient you were and how... how um, how tolerant the the adults were who were making the rules and the idea was that you had to not swim for that amount of time afterwards because otherwise you would get cramp when you were in the water because of the colder temperature and your body is putting all its effort into digesting your food and so therefore you would get cramp and if you get cramp which um, kind of locks your muscles up you might drown so of course the parents told you not to go swimming immediately after you'd been eating. Excuse me, I need to eat something. So though fear was upon her and she longed to hear male, male voices, she would not waken them. Even when she heard the sound of muffled oars, though her heart was in her mouth, she did not waken them. She stood over them to let them have their sleep out. Was it not brave of Wendy? It was well for those boys that then that there was one among them who could sniff danger even in his sleep. Peter sprang erect, as wide awake as at once as a dog, and with one warning cry he roused the others. He stood motionless, one hand to his ear. Pirates, he cried. The others came closer to him. A strange smile was playing about his face, and Wendy saw it and shuddered. While that smile was on his face, no one dared address him. All they could do was stand ready to obey. The order came sharp and decisive a and incisive. Dive! There was a gleam of legs and instantly the lagoon seemed deserted. Maroon's rock stood alone in the forbidding waters as if it were itself marooned. The boat drew nearer. It was the pirate dinghy with three figures in her, Smee and Starkey, and the third a captive. <clears throat> none other than Tiger Lily. Her hands and ankles were tied and she knew what was to be her fate. She was to be left on the rock to perish, an end to one of her race more terrible than death by fire or torture. For is it not written in the book of the tribe that there, that there is no path through water to the happy hunting ground? Happy hunting ground being the redskin equivalent of going to heaven when you die. 
Yet her face was impassive. She was the daughter of a chief. She must die as a chief's daughter. It is enough. They had caught her boarding the pirate ship with a knife in her mouth. No watch was kept on the ship, it being Hook's boast that the wind of his name guarded the ship for a mile around. Now her fate would help to guard it also. One more whale would go the round in that wind by night. In the gloom that they brought with them, the two pirates did not see the rock till they crashed into it. Luff, you lubber, cried an Irish voice that was Smee's. Here's the rock. Now then, what we have to do is hoist the redskin onto it and leave her there to drown. And by the way, I'm not doing an Irish accent because I'll get it mixed up and I'll do Scottish and I'll do Cornish and I'll do everything else. But so I'm just going to read it and tell you that he's Irish. And leave her there to drown. It was the work of one brutal moment to land the beautiful girl on the rock. She was too proud to offer a vain resistance. Quite near the rock, but out of sight, two heads were bobbing up and down. Peter's and Wendy's. Wendy was crying, for it was the first tragedy she had seen. Peter had seen many tragedies, but he had forgotten them all. That's part of being a boy who doesn't grow up. He was less sorry than Wendy for Tiger Lily. It was two against one that angered him, and he meant to save her. An easy way would have been to wait until the pirates had gone, but he was never one to choose the easy way. There was almost nothing he could not do, and he now imitated the voice of Hook. Ahoy there, you lubbers, he called. It was a marvellous imitation. The captain, said the pirates, staring at each other in surprise. He must be swimming out to us, Starkey said, when they had looked for him in vain. Obviously the boat only has one dinghy. We're putting the redskin on the rock, Smee called out. Set her free, came the astonishing answer. Free? Yes, cut her bonds and let her go. But Captain, at once, do you hear? cried Peter, or I'll plunge my hook in you. This is queer, Smee gasped. Better do what the Captain orders, said Starkey nervously. Aye, aye, Smee said, and he cut Tiger Lily's cords. At once, like an eel, she slid between Starkey's legs into the water. Of course, Wendy was very elated over Peter's cleverness, but she knew that he would be elated also, and very likely crow, and thus betray himself. So at once her hand went out to cover his mouth, but it was stayed even in the act, for Boat ahoy! rang over the lagoon in Hook's voice, and this time... It was not Peter who had spoken. Peter may have been about to crow, but his face puckered in a whistle of surprise instead. Boat ahoy! Again came the cry. So Hook is now calling to his boat, the dinghy. Now Wendy understood the real Hook was also in the water. He was swimming to the boat, and as his men showed a light to guide him, he had soon reached them. In the light of the lantern, Wendy saw his Hook, gripped the boat's side. She saw his evil, swarthy face as he rose dripping from the water, and quaking, she would have liked to swim away. But Peter would not budge. He was tingling with life and also top-heavy with conceit. Am I not a wonder? Oh, I am a wonder, he whispered to her. And though she thought so also, she was really glad for the sake of his reputation that no one heard him except her, herself. He signed to her to listen. The two pirates were very curious to know what had brought their captain to them, but he sat with his head on his hook in a position of profound melancholy. Captain, is all well? they asked timidly, but he answered with a hollow moan. He sighs, said Smee. He sighs again, said Starkey. And yet a third time he sighs, said Smee. What's up, captain? Then at last he spoke passionately. The game's up, he cried. Those boys have found a mother. Affrighted though she was, Wendy swelled with pride. Oh, evil day, cried Starkey. What's a mother? asked the ignorant Smee. Wendy was so shocked that she exclaimed, He doesn't know. And always after this, she felt that if she could have a pet pirate, Smee would be her one. Peter pulled her beneath the water, for Hook had started up, crying, What was that? I heard nothing, said Starkey raising the lantern over the waters, and as the pirates looked, they saw a strange sight. It was the nest I have told you of floating on the lagoon, and the never bird was sitting on it. See, said Hook, in answer to Smee's question, that is a mother. 
What a lesson! The nest must have fallen into the water. But would the mother desert her eggs? No. There was a break in his voice, as if for a moment he recalled innocent days when... But he brushed away this weakness with his hook. Smee, much impressed, gazed at the bird as the nest was borne past. But the more suspicious Starkey said, If she is a mother, perhaps she is hanging about here to help Peter. Hook winced. Aye, he said, that is the fear that haunts me. He was roused from this dejection by Smee's eager voice. Captain, said Smee, could we not kidnap these boys' mother and make her our mother? I didn't know the pirates wanted one. It is a princely scheme, cried Hook, and at once it took practical shape in his great brain. We will seize the children and carry them to the boat. The boys we will make walk the plank, and Wendy shall be our mother. Again, Wendy forgot herself. Never, she cried and bobbed. What was that? But they could see nothing. They thought it must have been but a leaf in the wind. Do you agree, my bullies? asked Hook. There is my hand on it, they both said, and here is my hook. Swear. They all swore. By this time they were on the rock, and suddenly Hook remembered Tiger Lily. Where is the red skin? he demanded abruptly. He had a playful humour at moments, and they thought this was one of the moments. That's all right, Captain, Smee answered complacently. We'll let her go. Let her go, said Hook. Twas your own orders. The boatswain faltered. You called over the water to us to let her go, said Starkey. Brimstone and gall, thundered Hook. What cozening is here? His face had gone black with rage, but he saw that they believed their words, and he was startled. Lads, he said, shaking a little, I gave no such order. It is passing queer, Smee said, and they all fidgeted uncomfortably. Hook raised his voice, but there was a quiver in it. Spirit that haunts this dark lagoon tonight, he cried. Dust hair me. Of course, Peter should have kept quiet. But of course, he did not. He immediately answered in Hook's voice. Odds, bods, hammer and tongs, I hear you. In that supreme moment, Hook did not blanch, even at the gills. But Smee and Starkey clung to each other in terror. Who are you, stranger? Speak, Hook demanded. I am James Hook, replied the voice, captain of the Jolly Roger. You are not, you are not, Hook cried coarsely. Hoarsely, brimstone and gall, the voice retorted. Say that again and I'll cast anchor in you. Hook tried a more ingratiating manner. If you are Hook, he said almost humbly, Come tell me who am I? A codfish, replied the voice. Only a codfish. A codfish, Hook echoed blankly, and it was then, but not till then, that his proud spirit broke. He saw his men draw back from him. Have we been captain all this time by a codfish, they muttered. It is lowering to our pride. They were his dogs snapping at him. They were his dogs, snapping at him. But tragic figure though he had become, he scarcely heeded them. Against such fearful evidence, it was not their belief in him that he needed. It was his own. He felt his ego slipping from him. Don't desert me, bully, he whispered hoarsely to it. In his dark nature, there was a touch of the feminine, as in all the great pirates, and it sometimes gave him intuitions. Suddenly, he tried the guessing game. Hook, he called, have you another voice? Now Peter could never resist a game, and he answered blithely in his own voice, I have. And another, and another name? Oi, oi. Vegetable? asked Cook. No. Mineral? No. Animal? Yes. Man? No, the answer rang out scornfully. Boy? Yes, ordinary boy. No, wonderful boy. To Wendy's pain, the answer that rang out this time was, Yes, are you in England? No, are you here? Yes. Oh, Hook was completely <laughs> puzzled. You ask him, you ask him some questions, he said to the other. You ask him some questions, he said to the others, wiping his damp brow. Smee reflected. 
I can't think of a thing, he said regretfully. Can't guess, can't guess, can't guess, crowed Peter. Do you give up? Of course, in his pride, he was carrying the game too far, and the miscreants saw their chance. Yes, yes, they answered eagerly. Well then, he cried, I am Peter Pan. Pan. In a moment, Hook was himself again, and Smee and Starkey were his faithful henchmen. Now we have him, Hook shouted, into the water. Smee, Starkey, mind the boat, take him dead or alive. He leapt as he spoke, and simultaneously came the gay voice of Peter. Are you ready, boys? Aye, aye, from various parts of the lagoon. Then lamb into the pirates. The fight was short and sharp. First to draw blood was John, who gallantly climbed into the boat and held Starkey. There was a fierce struggle in which the cutlass was torn from the pirate's grasp. (coughs) Sorry, Hook's voice is not the easiest on your throat. The cutlass was torn from the pirate's grasp. He wiggled overboard, wriggled overboard, and John leapt after him. The dinghy drifted away. Here and there a head bobbed up in the water and there was a flash of steel followed by a cry or a whoop. In the confusion some struck at their own side. The corkscrew of Smee got Tootles in the fourth rib but he himself was he was himself pinked in turn by Curly. Someone being pinked is when they've been touched by the blade either the, the pointy end of it or the edge of it so that you have a slight cut, and so you get a little bit of blood, but not lots. Um, and when it's in water, it looks pink, doesn't it? Uh, he himself pinked in return by Curly. Farther from the rock, Starkey was pressing slightly, and the twins hard. He's coming hard after them. Where all this time was Peter? He was seeking bigger game. The others were all brave boys and they must not be blamed for backing from the pirate captain. His iron claw made a circle of dead water round him, from which they fled like affrighted fishes. But there was one who did not fear him. There was one prepared to enter that circle. (coughs) Strangely, it was not in the water that they met. Hook rose to the rock to breathe, and at the same moment Peter scaled it on the opposite side. The rock was slippery as a ball, and they had to crawl rather than climb. (laughs) Neither knew that the other was coming, each feeling for a grip, met the other, because obviously the rock sticks up. It's not just a flat rock, because they would have seen each other. It sticks up, Uh, which is why they can be seen. They can't be seen, sorry. Um, (coughs) Each feeling for a grip met the other's arm. In surprise, they raised their heads. Their faces were almost touching, so they met. Some of the greatest heroes have confessed that just before they fell too, they had... And uh, I'm just puzzling over the way that's written. Just before... They fell too. They had a sinking. Had it been so with Peter at that moment, I would I would admit it. After all, this was the only man that the sea cook had feared. But Peter had no sinking. He had only one feeling only. So it's like a sinking in the pit of your stomach, obviously. He had one feeling only, gladness, and he gnashed his pretty teeth with joy. Quick as, as thought, he snatched a knife from Hook's belt and was about to drive it home when he saw that he was higher up the rock than his foe. It would not have been fighting fair. He gave the pirate a hand to help him up. It was then that Hook bit him. Not the pain of this, but its unfairness was what dazed Peter. It made him quite helpless. He could only stare, horrified. Every child is thus is affected thus the first time he is treated unfairly. All he thinks he has... All he thinks... He has a right to, when he comes to you, to be yours, is fairness. After you have been unfair to him, he will love you again, but he will never afterwards be quite the same boy. No one ever gets over the first unfairness. No one except Peter. He often met it, but he always forgot it. 
I suppose that was the real difference between him and all the rest. So when he met it now, it was like the first time, and he could just stare, helpless. Twice, the iron hand clawed him. A few minutes afterwards, the other boys saw Hook in the water, striking wildly for the ship. No elation on his pestilent face now, only white fear. For the crocodile was in dogged pursuit of him. On ordinary occasions, the boys would have swum alongside, cheering. But now they were uneasy, for they had lost both Peter and Wendy. And they were scouring the lagoon for them, calling them by name. They found the dinghy and went home in it, shouting, Peter, Wendy, as they went. But no answer came, save mocking laughter from the mermaids. They must be swimming back. Or flying, the boys concluded. They were not very anxious. They had such faith in Peter. They chuckled, boy-like, because they would be late for bed, and it was all Mother Wendy's fault. The one who said that you had to go to bed on time was the one whose fault it was that they would be late. When their voices died away, there came cold silence over the lagoon, and then a feeble cry. Help! Help! Two small figures were beating against the rock, the girl had fainted and lay on the boy's arm. With a last effort, Peter pulled her up the rock and then lay down beside her. Even as he also fainted, he saw that the water was rising. He knew that they would soon be drowned, but he could do no more. As they lay side by side, a mermaid caught Wendy by the feet and began pulling her softly into the water. Peter, feeling her slip from him, woke with a start and was just in time to draw her back, but he had to tell her the truth. We are on the rock, Wendy, he said, but it is growing smaller. Soon the water will be over it. She did not understand even now. We must go, she said, almost brightly. Yes, he answered faintly. Shall we swim or fly, Peter? Sorry, I'm looking for the next picture. just to get it ready. <clears throat> Shall we swim or fly, Peter? He had to tell her. Do you think you could swim or fly as far as the island, Wendy, without my help? She had to admit that she was too tired. He moaned. What is it? She asked, anxious about him at once. I can't help you, Wendy. Hook wounded me. I can neither fly nor swim. Do you mean we shall both be drowned? Look how the water is rising, said we said. Peter. They put their hands over their eyes to shut out the sight. They thought they would soon be no more. As they sat thus, something brushed against Peter, as light as a kiss, and stayed there, as if saying timidly, can I be of any use? It was the tail of a kite, which Michael had made some days before. It had torn itself out of his hand and floated away. Michael's kite, Peter said without interest, but next moment he had seized the tail and was pulling the kite towards him. It lifted Michael off the ground, he cried. Why should it not carry you? Both of us, it can't lift two, Michael and Curly tried. Let us draw lots, Wendy said bravely. And you a lady? Never, said Peter. Already he had tied the tail round her. She clung to him. She refused to go without him. But with a goodbye, Wendy, he pushed her from the rock, and in a few minutes she was born out of his sight. Peter was alone on the lagoon. The rock was very small now. Soon it would be submerged. Pale rays of light tiptoed across the waters, and by and by there was to be heard a sound at once most musical and the most melancholy in the world. The mermaids calling to the moon. Peter was not quite like other boys, but he was afraid at last. A tremor ran through him, like a shudder passing over the sea, but on the sea one shudder follows another till there are hundreds of them, and Peter felt just the one. Next moment he was standing erect on the rock again with that smile on his face and a drum beating within him. It was saying, to die will be an awfully big adventure. And here is your picture, and it's the last page of this chapter. To die will be an awfully big adventure. And I think that might be his hat. I'm not sure. And that's the moon. There's the island. Goodness me.
I better have something more to eat and drink. What about you? Go on. Go, make sure you've got something snackable and snack on it. I'm just getting this ready for the next one. Nearly there. Sorry, she knows. <sighs> we shall carry on. Right, I'm reading Peter Pan and Wendy by J. M. Barry, and I'm reading Chapter Nine. There you go. And it's now just after four o'clock, so it's probably only, um, it's actually quite a short chapter. It may or may not be the last chapter I read today. We'll see how we go. Chapter nine, The Never Bird. The last sounds Peter heard before he was quite alone were the mermaids retiring one by one to their bedchambers under the sea. He was too far away to hear their doors, doors shut, but every door in the coral caves where they live rings a tiny bell when it opens or closes, as in all the nicest houses on the mainland. And he heard the bells. Steadily the waters rose till they were nibbling at his feet, and to pass the time until they made their final gulp, he watched the only thing moving on the lagoon. He thought it was a piece of floating paper, perhaps part of a kite, and wondered idly how long it would take to drift ashore. Presently he noticed, as an odd thing, that it was undoubtedly out upon the lagoon with some definite purpose, for it was fighting the tide, and sometimes winning, and when it won, Peter, always sympathetic to the weaker side, could not help clapping. It was such a gallant piece of paper. It was not really a piece of paper. It was the never bird, making desperate efforts to reach Peter on her nest, by working her wings in a way she had learned since the nest fell into the water, she was able to some extent to guide her strange craft, but by the time Peter recognised her, she was very exhausted. She had come to save him, to give him her nest, though there were eggs in it. I rather wonder at the bird, for though he had been nice to her, he had also sometimes tormented her. I can suppose only that, like Mrs Darling and the rest of them, she was melted because he had all his first teeth. In other words, they see him as still a young lad. Still got his baby teeth. And so for a lot of people, a lot of women from a particular era, that meant that someone was sweet and cute and young. She called out to him what she had come for, and he called out to her what she what was she doing there. But of course neither of them understood the other's language. In fanciful stories, people can talk to the birds freely, and I wish for the moment that I could pretend that this was such a story and say that Peter replied intelligently to the never bird, but truth is best and I want to tell only what really happened. Well, not only could they not understand each other, but they forgot their manners. I want you to get into the nest, the bird called, speaking as slowly and distinctly as possible, and then you can drift ashore, but I am too tired to bring it any nearer, so you must try to swim to it. What are you quacking about? Peter answered. Why don't you let the nest drift as usual? I want you, the bird said, and repeated it all over. Then Peter tried slow and distinct. What? Are you quacking about? And so on. The never bird became irritated. They have very short tempers. You dunderhead little jay, she screamed. Why don't you do as I tell you? Peter felt that she was calling him names. And at a venture, he retorted hotly, So are you. Then, and rather curiously, they both snapped out the same remark. Shut up. Nevertheless, the bird was determined to save him if she could, and by one last 
mighty effort, she propelled the nest against the rock. Then up she flew, deserting her eggs so as to make her meaning clear. Then at last he understood and clutched the nest and waved his thanks to the bird as she fluttered overhead. It was not to receive his thanks, however, that she hung there in the sky. It was not even to watch him get into the nest. It was to see what he did with her eggs. There were two large white eggs, and Peter lifted them up and reflected. The bird covered her face with her wings so as not to see the last of her eggs, but she could not help peeping between the feathers. I forget whether I have told you that there was a stave on the rock, driven into it by some buccaneers of long ago to mark the site of buried treasure. The children had discovered the glittering hoard, and when in mischievous mood, used to fling showers of moidores, diamonds, pearls and pieces of eight, to the gulls who pounced upon them for food and then flew away, raging at the scurvy trick that had been played upon them. The stave was still there, and on its stack he had hung his hat, a deep tarpaulin, watertight, with a broad brim. Peter put the eggs into this hat and set it on the lagoon. It fo floated beautifully. The never bird saw at once what he was up to and screamed her admiration of him, and, alas, Peter crowed his agreement with her. Then he got into the nest, reared the stave in it as a mast, and hung up his shirt for a sail. At the same moment, the bird fluttered down upon the hat and once more sat snugly on her eggs. She drifted in one direction and he was borne off in another, both cheering. Of course, when Peter landed, he beached his bark in a place where the bird would easily find it. But the hat was such a great success that she abandoned the nest. It drifted about till it went to pieces, and often Starkey came to the shore of the lagoon and with many bitter feelings watched the bird sitting on his hat. As we shall not see her again, it may be worth mentioning here that all never birds now build in that shape of nest, with a broad brim on which the youngsters take an airing. Great were the rejoicings when Peter reached the home under the ground, almost as soon as Wendy, who had been carried hither and thither by the kite. Every boy had adventures to tell, but perhaps the biggest adventure of all was that they were several hours late for bed. This so inflated them that they did various dodgy things to get staying up still longer, such as demanding bandages. But Wendy, though glorifying and having them all home again safe and sound, was scandalised by the lateness of the hour and cried, To bed! To bed! in a voice that had to be obeyed. Next day, however, she was awfully tender and gave out bandages to every one and they played till bedtime at limping about and carrying their arms in slings. And that's the end of that chapter and today's reading. So, do you remember that, the never bird and her nest? Do you remember what happened from previous hearings of the story? I don't even remember if the Disney version has the never bird in. I can't remember because there's a lot of the, the Disney retellings are nothing like the original stories. Anyway, so what's up now? What's up now is that I'm going to finish and stop streaming and you're going to carry on with whatever it was that you were doing before and we will see you next time hopefully yeah that would be good wouldn't it thank you for being here thank you for listening it's lovely to actually have you here as part of what's going on and just in case you're wondering I'm depending on where you're actually watching this I read live on twitch which is what I'm doing at the moment and <clears throat> the link for that that most people follow is actually probably the one that's on my Instagram. I usually post on Instagram when I'm going to be going live later in the afternoon. And then after I've read on Twitch, two weeks later, I put the same story up on YouTube as a recording. But just this bit here, without the, um, the rest of the overlay with the chat and all that sort of stuff. And I put them into playlists so that people can listen to a whole book once we've actually finished a whole book. And so if you're listening on YouTube, that's wonderful. Thank you. You can put click on the, on the thumbs up button down below, the like button. And then YouTube is much more likely to show you when I put another, uh, another um, story up, another part of a story up. But the way to be really sure if you're on YouTube 
to make sure you really know if I've put up a new story is you click the subscribe button, which is free, and you also click the bell icon that's next to it, and then YouTube will notify you when I have put a new story up or a new section of a story up. So there you go. And if you're watching this on Twitch and you want to be notified when I go live, then you click the heart button below, which is the follow button. That's what it's called. It's the follow button, even though it looks like a heart. And so all the wonderful technical things that you can do. And if you aren't a member of either, if you haven't joined either, um, doing so is free. So you can join YouTube, you can join Twitch, it doesn't cost to join either of them, and then you can do those things. You can't click on any of those and have it work if you haven't actually signed in, and to sign in you need to have joined. Anyway, so there you go. That's your tech education for today as well as the story. We're doing really well, aren't we? So we'll see you next time. Thanks for being here, thanks for listening, and don't forget next time, bring along your drink of water, stay hydrated, to stay hydrated, your snack, and have somewhere comfortable to sit. And I don't mind at all if you're working or studying while you're listening. That's great if I'm keeping you company. And if you're on YouTube, you're welcome to put a comment about what you do as to how you actually are participating in the, in the storytelling. Uh, you can join our Discord server. I've got links for that on YouTube and I've also got it on my Twitch channel. But there you go. Um, and you can chat when I'm not online. Okay, bye.